All right, so we just finished discussing LDC agriculture. Now we're going to look at MDC agriculture, which of course is primarily commercial agriculture. This is when farmers are going to produce crops and animals primarily for sale rather than for their own direct consumption. Um, this is also a very small percentage of the workforce, roughly 2%. Uh, in Canada and the United States, and MDCs overall about 3%. One example is mixed crop and livestock. Mixed crop and livestock actually occurs uh, in this area quite a bit. So found in the United States, west of the Appalachian Mountains. It's also found across Europe, primarily in Eastern Europe. This is the integration of livestock and crop farming. You're not going to need a huge amount of land for this. However, the majority of the land that you do have is going to be used for crops. However, while you make a whole lot of crops, you're not actually selling the crops. A lot of the crops are actually going to go to feeding your livestock. Livestock is where the majority of your income is going to come from. So selling off your livestock uh, for animal products, um, usually to larger um, processing plants and things like that, uh, makes up about 70 to 75% of your income. Uh, you might actually sell just a little bit of like surplus agriculture, surplus uh, crops that you have. But for the most part, that's just going to feed your cattle or whatever form of livestock you have. Um, it is really important that you use crop rotation in this type of farming because again, you don't have a whole lot of fields, so you're not gonna allow any to fallow. Uh, additionally, uh, the corn is actually the number one used um, crop in mixed crop and livestock, and the second most used and most um, important is soybeans. The advantages of mixed crop and livestock is livestock are going to supply manure. Manure can actually be used as fertilizer on your fields. The workload is evenly distributed throughout the year because even though you may not be actually crop farming at the time, you're still raising livestock and taking care of them. There's also less seasonal variation in income because you're not dependent upon the crop for your money. When we talk about mixed crop and livestock, you can sometimes find this in LDCs. I wanted to mention this here, even though it's not a form of commercial farming. Uh, we actually are seeing LDC countries start to figure out how to use this mixed crop and livestock, and a lot of them have been using it a lot longer than we have. Um, examples of this, Nigerians. Um, in some certain areas of Nigeria, they actually are going to concentrate cattle on their land because their ground is too hard to actually plant the seed. And instead of using machines, which some of them don't have, They'll use the hooves to break up the soil, and therefore then they can go back and actually plant the seed in the broken soil surface the next morning. Um, other examples in Malaysia, they actually graze their cattle and goats underneath uh, their coconut and rubber plantation trees. And this actually results in a couple things. The cow dung or cow manure um, use, is used as fertilizer. Cows actually reduce herbicide use by about 40% on these plantations, which means they're not using weed killer because the cows are actually eating the weeds. Uh, and then the cows are also used for milk. So it's a pretty cool sort of uh, interaction between mixed crop and livestock. It's not just found in MDCs. Um, it can also be found in LDCs, primarily areas where they're trying to intensively subsistence farm and get as much from the land as possible. All right, so quickly, let's move on to dairying. Dairying, if we're looking at producers of dairy, so dairy is going to be milk from cows. However, you also see milk from camels, goats, sheep, that type of stuff. Um, so milk production, you can see that there are a couple areas of the world where it's very, very high. India, of course, the United States, Pakistan, um, China, and Russia. So it's a form of commercial agriculture. It's usually located near cities. We'll talk about that in just a moment. India, like I said, is the world's largest producer of milk, followed by the United States, Pakistan, China, and Russia. Um, you need to keep in mind that when looking at the location of dairy farms, they are going to be lying in what we call a milk shed. The milk shed is like a geographic ring around a city, or we're going to use the word market area, from which a milk, um, milk can be supplied without it spoiling. Milk is highly perishable, even though we go through pasteurization and homogenization today. It's still really perishable. The dairy farms have to be closer to the markets than other type of farms. Uh, in the 1840s, the milk shed was about 30 miles away. Now it's, it can actually extend up to about 300 um, miles away. And usually it's going to be transported by truck. Um, trucking, transportation improvements have allowed dairy <clears throat> to move further away from the market. You have refrigerated trucking, refrigerated uh, train cars as well. Um, but keep this in mind, the further away you are from a market, the less likely you are to produce milk for sale, and instead you're going to produce cheese or butter or soap or something like that. So this actually applies really well um, to von Thunen's model. Von Thunen, again, suggesting that dairy needed to be really, really close to the city center. <clears throat> and if we're looking at um, development in the United States, we'll actually see the majority of the markets in the early United States were located on the East Coast, East Coast cities. So therefore, most of the dairy farms in the East Coast made milk, whereas Wisconsin is actually going to specialize in um, changing that milk into cheese or butter, something that doesn't perish, and yet they're still going to profit from 
uh, using dairy. Um, dairy, like most commercial farmers, dairy farmers are not going to actually sell their products directly to consumers, so it's not like you're going to have the dairy come to your door and drop things off it, um, however that used to work. Uh, they actually are going to sell to wholesalers who are going to then distribute to retailers who then sell it, of course, to you and I. Um, they are facing declining revenues uh, and rising costs in the dairy industry right now. A lot of this is because it's incredibly labor intensive. Cows must be milked often. If you're using human labor, this is going to be um, incredibly expensive and a lot of workers. If you're using machines, the machines are incredibly expensive as well. Cows also have to be fed in the winter months when they can't graze on grass. And uh, depending on season, so for around here, last year was a terrible, terrible, terrible season, uh, summer for hay. And so because of this, dairy farmers around here have had to buy hay from as far away as like Wyoming and California and things like that, which means you have to pay for the transportation costs of bringing it in. This actually means that local dairies, probably their cost to um, the work uh, actually goes up and that cost usually gets passed on to uh, the consumer. Uh, the farms are also decreasing, so the number of dairy farms has gone down in recent years, but the number of cows per farm is increasing, and that's because individual cows are producing more milk. A lot of that is actually because of the mechanization process, which means they can be farmed, I'm sorry, milked uh, more than twice a day. All right, another type of farming that we need to talk about is grain farming. Grain is the seed from various grasses. It could be wheat, corn, barley, rice, millet, uh, and there are several others. On a grain farm, the crops are grown for usually human consumption, but they can also be grown for animal consumption and then also fuel. Uh, crops are sold to food manufacturers. They're not actually producing any sort of food on the farm itself. The most important crop in grain farming is wheat which is usually used to make flour. Um, when we're talking about the wheat producers of the world, China is the number one wheat producer, followed by India and then the United States. Wheat usually can be sold for a higher price than other grains, and it stores really well without spoiling, so a lot of times people will hold it in their silos uh, until market prices are to a point where they see okay, that they might profit more than maybe another time of the year where market prices are low. Um, oftentimes, uh, grain farming relies a great deal on mechanization and machines. Um, combines also <clears throat> are, um, again, like to buy a combine, it's going to cost you roughly half a million to a million dollars, depending on what type of technology they have in them. Um, but again, this is going to speed up your process uh, and you can farm more land. Grain farming also takes up a lot of land, so it's not going to be located relatively close to uh, the city center or market area, and it doesn't spoil, so you don't have to worry about that. If we're looking at the wheat production, you can see China, Russia, India, um, Australia, the United States, Argentina, etc. high in wheat production. Another form of farming that we need to talk about is ranching. Commercial uh, livestock ranching is the commercial grazing of livestock over an extensive area. Extensive means it's an awful lot of land um, and you're not going to be using it intensively. So you're going to be grazing your livestock across it. Once they've grazed across it, you're going to move on to another patch of land and let it regrow. And it takes a lot of land for you to actually do this. Um, Western United States is known for its cattle ranching. Also, South America, the Pampas, um, these are like the highland prairies in Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay, <clears throat> are becoming increasingly known for ranching. Um, this also results in some deforestation of the rainforest. Uh, it becomes uh, sedentary. It used to be something that actually was a little bit more like pastoral nomadism when we had the cattle drive. However, railroads, uh, range wars, barbed wire, that type of thing in the late 1800s is going to put an end to that. So now people actually have to buy up all of the land for their ranch, which means an awful lot of land means you're going to be far away from the market area. Um, being far away from the market area will allow that land to be super duper cheap which is something that you'll need. At the same time, you also have to consider this land does not need to be like incredibly fertile soil because you just need grasses to grow on it. So it doesn't have to be prime agricultural land that again would cost more. Um, ranchers are losing grazing land due to irrigation improvements, which irrigation improvements means you can change some of that kind of terrible soil into better soil and people will see that they can maybe make more money off of wheat farming or corn farming or that type of thing. Um, and so therefore the price of that land will go up and it's no longer feasible for you to graze animals on it. Um, additionally, industrialized feedlots and feed farms, we've talked about this, factory farms uh, are starting to take over where people see, okay, look how much work this is, look how much land this takes. It's easier if we just shove all of these cows or pigs or whatever into these great big industrial feedlots. We force feed them whatever we want to. They're sedentary, they gain weight, they bulk up. Um, but again, this is not the most natural habitat for livestock, and people are becoming a lot more concerned about the ethical raising of animals and also um, what they're eating, so grass-fed versus grain-fed cows and that type of stuff. 
Uh, another type of commercial agriculture is Mediterranean agriculture. This is found, of course, in the Mediterranean region of the world, but do not discount California, Chile, uh, particularly the west coast of um, California, the west coast of Chile, and parts of South Africa and Australia. All of these areas are going to border seas. They have west coasts. All of those are on the west coast of continents, um, which is going to bring in moisture from sea winds. Additionally, they have really moderate winter temps, but really hot and dry summers. Um, this land is going to be really hilly and uh, mountainous land as well. The soil is not especially great for other things, um, but it's really good for horticulture. The growing of uh, horticulture is, of course, the growing of, um, sorry, it looks like it's not on there, uh, flowers, uh, tree crops. All right, sorry, got um, actually sidetracked there. Sorry, uh, quick interruption. So uh, when we talk about Mediterranean agriculture, this is going to uh, specialize in horticulture, which is the growing of fruits and vegetables, flowers and tree crops, um, things like olives, grapes, uh, citrus fruits, that type of stuff. They also, it's really, really important to know that Mediterranean agriculture does specialize in cereal grains as well. So wheat is another product that they're going to specialize in. And if you think of a Mediterranean diet, things like pasta, um, olives, grapes, uh, wine, all of those types of things fall right in line there. All right, uh, I want to talk quickly about the third agricultural revolution. We have not yet done this, and this is sometimes called the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution happened in the late 20th century, around 1960, 1970. People started looking for solutions to world hunger. Um, the uh, keys to the third agricultural revolution are actually going to be threefold. Uh, one is mechanization, two is chemical farming, and three is going to be food manufacturing. So this is going to be the replacement of human farm labor with machines. I want to mention, again, this is MDCs really focusing on uh, improving crop yields, but this is also MDCs trying to improve crop yields in LDCs. So these are people who are actually carrying some of these ideas to LDCs in order to improve um, crop output and therefore hopefully decrease death rates, starvation rates, famine rates uh, in LDCs of the world, and specifically in the 1960s and 70s, think Cold War era, um, right after the medical revolution, this is going to cause a lot of LDCs to move into stage two of the demographic transition model. Chemical farming is also going to be used. Uh, large packages of chemicals, application of these synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, which gets rid of uh, weeds, fungicides, pesticides in order to enhance crop yields. Uh, this is a huge, huge, huge part of the Green Revolution. So not only mechanization with machines, but also chemical farming. And then the last part of the third agricultural revolution or the Green Revolution is, can, uh, is called uh, food manufacturing, which this is actually involving the economic values uh, to agricultural products through a range of treatments. So this would be things like processing, canning, refining, packaging, um, all that sort of stuff occurring off of the farm, whereas before it always occurred on the farm. So now um, farmers themselves are not responsible for the food manufacturing aspect and they'll actually sell it to a food manufacturer to take care of. The result of the Green Revolution is that the MDC countries of the world export a huge package of fertilizers, high yield seeds to LDC countries in order to increase the global agricultural productivity. So again, in order to bring down famine uh, rates. Uh, this also is going to prevent famines in uh, Asia, primarily India and Mexico. India and Mexico are actually going to um, do really well with Green Revolution. Um, seed packages and fertilizer, there, a lot of them are actually going to have surplus agriculture, which means they are no longer just subsistence farming. They are, but any extras that they have, they're actually going to be able to sell. Uh, chemical fertilizers, unfortunately, are going to use uh, uh, cause a lot of pollution, a lot of water runoff. Monsoon seasons uh, is going to result in that pollution actually moving into people's water. Um, that's a problem. Uh, additionally, farmers are going to be able are going to struggle to be able to afford the Green Revolution seed packages. A lot of them will unfortunately take out loans for high yield seeds or maybe for fertilizers, but then one bad year is going to ruin a farm. And if they don't make any money that year, they can't pay back their loan. And if they can't pay back their loan, then usually they end up losing their land and they go into um, unemployment. Uh, another example of this is actually machines taking over workers' uh, jobs. And this, of course, is a negative downfall um, is going to be uh, unemployment. So while the Green Revolution was excellent for providing more food for the world, the downside is mechanization is actually going to take away a lot of jobs, particularly women's jobs in uh, agriculture. And then additionally, the chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, that type of stuff are not going to necessarily be regulated because countries would rather deal with um, a lack of famine rather than say things like cancer that will happen years down the road that they don't have to deal with immediately. All right, we're going to stop there. We'll talk about agricultural industrialization and some of the uh, additional changes